folks, this is Dave Isaacs with you. It is January the 4th of 2021, so Happy New Year, first of all. And I want to thank everyone who has been watching these videos and following and subscribing to this channel. We just passed 20,000 subscribers at the end of December, so I am ecstatic about that. And I really appreciate your support, your interest, your comments, your emails reaching out to me individually. It's been a very gratifying journey building this channel. And at this point now, it's becoming really one of my primary projects. So I will be continuing to add more and more new content and increasing the pace of new material that goes up as we go on into 2021. So I thank you for your part in that. And I'm excited to, to open up new areas and see where all of this goes. Keep in mind that if you feel like there's something you would really like to see, if you've been following what I do and appreciate my teaching style, but there's a topic or a song that you'd like to see me tackle, then by all means, drop a comment. Drop me a note, Dave at DaveIsaacs.com. What I really wanted to talk about today, though, was two big ideas that could completely change your guitar playing in 2021. These are things that are practically universal in the sense that most people who, well, when people were walking into my studio, most people who come to me for lessons are wrestling in some form with one or both of these challenges. And the good news is you really just have to start thinking a little differently about what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish in order to meet these challenges and build the skills that we're really looking to build. The first area I want to talk about is rhythm. People talk about musicians having good time, which basically means that you can keep a steady beat, but it means more than that. It means that you can keep track of that steady beat internally without having to follow an outside source to give it to you. And on top of that, you can keep track of both your parts and other players' parts against that beat while that's going on. When you have a group of musicians playing together, the drummer might be the one keeping the pulse, but the bottom line is the entire group is feeling that same pulse. There's an internal sensation that is shared by all the players. Now, there are variables in the way somebody might approach one feel or another. Some players play a little ahead of the beat, some play a little bit behind, some players have enough control that they can choose to do one or the other. And if you think of the beat as being a bullseye, let's say you're playing darts, you could hit that bullseye and still be a little to one side or a little to the other, and that is going to impact the feeling of the music. As I said, really adept musicians are able to choose when they want to hang back a little bit or surge forward a little bit. You may have a natural place where you tend to feel it. I will say that in my own musical journey, the last 30 years have really been about learning how to lay back, learning how to relax. I talk a lot about learning to be lighter, learning to be looser. That's part of that but also just to have less sense of urgency about where's the beat, where's the beat, just to be able to relax into it and feel it. So understand this, if you struggle with rhythm, and a lot of people do, understand that you're really talking about a couple of fundamentals here. Skill number one is being able to feel that beat internally for it to be a visceral, physical thing inside your body. You will find that moving helps a lot Maybe you're tapping your foot, but maybe you're one of those people that can't quite seem to tap your foot, or you can't decouple it from your hand. So your hand and foot are going to go together no matter what you do, whether you're in time or not. You need to find a way to feel what steady feels like. And in my experience, for most people, no matter whether you have trouble, trouble coordinating anything else or not, just rocking your body or nodding your head is usually enough. We all have a sense of what steady feels like. If your heart beats and you breathe, you know what steady feels like. If you can walk, you know what steady feels like. So the challenge is not keeping the steady beat. The challenge is being able to keep that beat in the back of your mind as essentially an unconscious reference that then measures out, that determines where you place every note you play relative to the timeline established by that beat. So in other words, you're keeping track of multiple things. You're keeping track of what you're doing, and you're keeping track of what's going on around you. And there are degrees of how conscious that process is going to be, but for the most part, good players are doing it unconsciously, or at least I should say, naturally. 
that's what listening to each other really means. It's just making sure that you're all in the same place. When you're too busy thinking about the beat, it's hard to listen. But when the beat is internal, when the beat is a feeling, the beat is a sensation, then you can start using that as a reference, something that you measure things against. And so you can practice this stuff by just feeling a beat and then playing notes of different durations over it. Half notes. I forgot I was in drop D. One, two, then quarters, because we're grouping notes, right? When we play the half note, grouping beats, I'm sorry. Eighth notes is subdividing. The subdivisions are what tend to mess people up, by and large. So you want to be able to establish that sense of steady and then to fine tune, to calibrate your sense of how you take that steady beat and divide it up into equal or unequal parts. Say we're talking about quarter notes being divided into eighths or being divided into triplets for a shuffle. One and a two and a one and a two and a. People struggle with that sometimes. A lot of beginners or long-term beginners find that it's difficult to differentiate between straight and swung or shuffle feels, but we're just talking about subdivisions. Are you splitting in two or are you splitting in three? Are you splitting evenly or unevenly? If you find the mathematical part confounds your brain, then feel it. It is a visceral thing. There is nothing abstract or intellectual about rhythm, even though there's a mathematical aspect to it. It is physical sensation. And even if we want to talk about acoustics and what actually sound, what sound actually is, there are air molecules hitting your eardrum at regular intervals, and that is what creates rhythm. So when you think of it that way, when you give yourself, when you allow yourself the recognition that you can keep a beat, even if you struggle to do it, when you let your body guide it. As soon as you recognize that, as soon as you've created that foundation for yourself, now it's simply a matter of getting more and more awareness and control over where you put things relative to that beat. It's simply a matter of fine-tuning and developing, I shouldn't say simply, it's a matter of fine-tuning and developing your sense of time so that you can take a steady beat and choose how to divide it up. To put it in a nutshell, you need to be able to keep steady time with your body and then hear the subdivisions and groupings of that beat with your mind. Just picture a ruler marking inches, half inch, quarter inch, or centimeters, millimeters, whatever it is. Any measurement can then be split into smaller measurements. And that's what I'm talking about when I refer to subdividing the beat. It's a feel and a sensation as much as anything else. Just start paying attention to that and recognizing that when the beat is in your body, you're going to have a much easier time feeling these things than if you're trying to make it something intellectual and count. And the fact is that even tapping your foot might not be enough to put it in your body if your foot is so attached to your hand that these two things can't separate. It needs to be something internal that can be articulated. Think about drummers. Drummers can articulate the beat with any of the four limbs, two hands, two feet, but they've got to feel it internally. And I think one advantage that drummers have is that because they use all four limbs, they're going to feel the beat more in here. Whereas as guitarists, it's very easy for us to have our awareness out here in front of the guitar. You're just thinking about where you land and the rest of the body just sort of disappears from your mental picture. But your body is what allows you to feel rhythm. That's really essential. It's just an idea, but keep that idea in your head as you go forward. That's big idea number one. Big idea number two has to do specifically with melody and lead and improvisation, playing single note melodies on the guitar. If you've been using the internet resources out there, you're using one right now, then you've probably watched lots of videos about scales, three notes per string, caged, formations, shapes, modes, diatonic, pentatonic, hexatonic, what is all of this stuff? Well, it's great to learn scales. It's valuable to learn scales. 
Learning scales gives you technical coordination as you essentially go through the target practice aspect of just making sure your finger goes to the right place. It teaches you the layout of the guitar neck because as you get to know the scales, you get to know the relationships within the scale. It's showing you how patterns fall across the neck. It also gives you a connection to sound because if you take a major scale and think of it as do, re, mi, then not only have we mapped out a C scale, but we've, not, we've mapped out eight notes, each of which occupies a particular position in the sequence, has its own sound that can be recognized by the ear, and essentially allowing you to build a command of melody by listening to the way that notes relate to each other. The problem is, if your focus is so heavily on scales, Many, many people find that it's difficult to take a step back from the scale aspect and just play a tune. But what I would say to that is that if you've been practicing scales as a sequence with a beginning and an end, and basically the way you go about it is just to start at the beginning and end at the end, and you do that over and over and over again, that's fine. That's reinforcing your knowledge of the scale, but it's not teaching you to improvise. It is not teaching you to play lead, and it's not teaching you how to use that scale. What you need to do is learn about phrasing. There's lots of resources out there about that, but basically, phrasing is just the way that you organize the notes, coming back to the idea of rhythm and rhythmic groupings, but also in terms of melody, in terms of contour and line, when notes go up, when notes go down. I could draw a picture of that. Booyah! My hand went out of the frame, but you get the idea. Sheet music is great this way, music notation, because you can actually see the distance. There's a direct relationship between how far apart the notes are on the page and how far apart they are in sound, in terms of distance from each other on the scale. This is the thing you need to learn to understand, and it's not necessarily just about knowing the theory, although the theory can help. It has to do with listening for what I would call coherent musical ideas. I like the word cells for this, rhythmic and melodic cells. And no matter how complicated a lick or a line is, you can break that very complicated lick or line down into smaller pieces, into rhythmic or melodic fragments that strung together create this long line. And so you need to be able to work with these short ideas, with these little ideas, before you start trying to apply the whole scale. If you're saying, yeah, but I want to be able to play fast and I want to be able to shred and all that stuff, and yeah, that's fantastic. I'm not contradicting anything anybody else is telling you. Other than the fact that if you want to have something to say, and this is what all the greats will tell you, you still have to have something to say. You still have to make musical statements, just in the way that when I'm talking to you right now, if I don't choose my words right, if I don't speak in coherent sentences, you're not going to understand what I'm trying to put across. And in music, it's really the same way. The comprehension is just more abstract. Comprehension in music just means, yeah, that sounds good. And so we start real simple with just a handful of notes. You might take a pentatonic scale and play with three notes. Well, that sounds good. Add another note. I've talked about this before. In fact, I've got several videos that go into this idea. But I can't stress it enough because I hear over and over and over again People saying things like, well, I know all my scales, I studied all my modes, I know everything all up and down the neck, all the positions, and I still can't play a solo. And it's because you learned how to map out things with your fingers, but you didn't learn how to direct ideas with your ears. And if this is something that you find challenging to do, you should be sitting down and transcribing. You should be learning solos because the fact is, you learned how to speak by listening to other people talk. Music is no different. We just have to take a closer look, and of course the immersion level is not the same as when you were two years old learning how to talk. But you still have to imitate to some degree. If you don't have a clear idea of what it means to have organized phrasing, then look at real musical examples. 
Listen for the space between the notes. Listen for the space between phrases, between musical ideas. It's all about making statements. And something with lots of notes and a lot of speed can still be a strong musical statement. Even the gesture itself of just a fast scale is a musical statement. But it's got to fit into some kind of context. And it really isn't all that helpful for me to use more words to describe what creates that context. Because the fact is, you've listened to music all your life. You already know what that context is because you know when it sounds right or when it sounds wrong. What's the line? Isn't there supposedly a Mick Jagger quote where he said, I don't know anything about music, but I know what I like? When it comes right down to it, that's really what it is. What do you hear? Does it sound good? Do the notes sound like they belong together? Or is something clearly jarring and out of place? Or is it out of place on purpose? Doesn't really matter. The point is, this is all about thinking. I know some of you watch these videos, and of course, if you are this kind of person, you probably didn't get this far into this video anyway. But I get comments from time to time saying, God, Dave, why do you talk so much? Or, talk, 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 why doesn't this guy shut up and play? Well, there's people out there doing that. That's fine. It doesn't work for everybody. Aside from the fact that every great musician, except for maybe the most intuitively talented, and even then, I would say that every great musician learns how to shape the music, how to control it as it comes out. Not in a, I'm going to play an A, I'm going to play a B. Not so much like that, but in the way that when you jumped off a high board for the first time, you had no control over what was going to happen. Your feet left that board. It was just scrunch up your face and hope for the best. And you hit the water, you hit the water however. But when you learn how to dive, you can control every part of that fall. You control how you move, how you land, how you get into the water. You are no longer just taking the step and hoping for the best. You are directing what's going on. The movement carries you, but you have skills to direct that movement, and that's really what we're talking about, and it all comes from listening. So your single biggest goal in 2021 is to be a better listener, and if we split that into the two parts I've been talking about today, developing and honing your sense of rhythm understanding the difference between pulse, the steady beat, meter, the repeating cycle of groups of beats, twos, threes, fours, and subdivision, dividing that beat up into smaller segments, and being able to feel and manipulate that in time as you continue to be aware of that steady pulse inside your body. That's essential. That in itself is going to inform the second piece the melody and lead guitar part, because the organizing factor in music is rhythm, or the primary organizing factor in music. Yes, intervals, harmony, things like that, that's all important too. But if you don't have a good sense of time, you are not going to be a good lead guitar player, no matter how fast you can play. Understand that. Know that. It doesn't mean you have to play simply. However, if you can't play simply well, then you need to take a huge step back and recognize that if you can't do a simple thing well, then you're just throwing away a lot of effort in trying to hack your way through something difficult. That's not to say that you can't have fun sitting down and working on something that really is beyond you technically, but is enjoyable to try, even just to mess with it. But at the same time, part of your practicing has to be about honing, polishing, learning to control. And if that means that the thing you can control is this, It's okay with me. Got to start somewhere. It's all going to build up from there. I hope you have a fantastic 2021, and this video is going to stay on YouTube, so you could be watching this five years from now, and God willing, it was a fantastic 21. But big ideas that are really going to do you a lot of good as a guitar player. Just remember, when people say, oh, well, good musicians don't think when they play, that's really not true. But the question is, what are they thinking about? Or, more to the point, what are they aware of and what are they reacting to? That is the key. I'm Dave Isaacs. I'll see you next time.